The future is in the past! Onward, Sayoshima! Hey, listen, you found us. Episode 25, Half Glass Gaming. It is the end of the year, almost. And we're going to be doing stuff and talking things. Uh, I want to do a quick round of introductions, if I could, just to get that out of the way. Because we have a lot of ground to cover, and my dogs are already barking. So, of course, first, I'd like to introduce the Reverend. Uh, I am the Reverend. That is who I am. Yes, and then, haha, next, Josh. That's me. And third, but by no means third. Mandy. Hey. No, Mandy is the heart and soul of this podcast. Yeah, she's our Ray Charles. <laughs> Ray Charles of laughing. <laughs> <laughs> she's the Ray Charles. Laughing too loudly. It she's the Ray Charles really of joke. our Carlos Mencia. <laughs> uh, look, I'm Julian. Okay, welcome. Um, like I said, we got a lot of ground to cover on this episode, so we're not going to uh, meander and, and uh, spin our wheels in the mud. We're going to throw some cardboard down and we're going to get right out of this rut. First and foremost, well, actually, this probably isn't first and foremost. This is probably second and utmost. I'd like to thank our listeners. You guys have uh, really made this worthwhile. We have some great commenters and a great community on Retrovolve. It's, yeah. It really is amazing. And I'm happy and impressed every time I open the articles of our episodes and read the comments, mm-hmm. which how often can anyone say, I looked at an internet comment section and I was happy? Mm-hmm. You know, maybe I'm speaking bad things into existence by saying this, but Retrovolve hasn't had to moderate our comments at all mm-hmm. because our commenters are so great. And mm-hmm. I think that's wonderful. Yeah, And in the gaming seen especially that's very rare right i mean it, it'll happen eventually because as we get bigger we're gonna get assholes but as of right now our our community is really fantastic they have interesting things to add to you know what we say in the podcast mm-hmm. they have interesting ideas of what to talk about it's really great and i'm really happy to have them yeah and with that said uh i need some updates <laughs> you got your uh, Reddit uh, SNES, uh, Josh? I did. I got I got my Super Nintendo in the mail the other day, and I plugged it in and hooked it up and put in Donkey Kong Country, and it worked fine, and I played a bunch of it and was like, oh, cool, this is great. And so I sent a thank you email to the guy and, and responded to the thread on Reddit and was mm-hmm. like, oh, you know, thanks for coming through. A couple days later, I started trying out some of the other games. You know, when I stumble upon a cheap game that I really want for SNES, now it's just like, oh, I have an SNES, I'll buy this. And so I have three more games that I got from different sources, and none of them work. And so I'm trying to figure out, you know, are the games just dirty? Are they just not working cartridges? Is there Mm -hmm. something wrong with my SNES? And so I'm trying to sort through that, and I think I'm going to have to send a follow-up email to this guy on Reddit and be like... Look, man, mm-hmm. I don't know what's going on here. Man, an SNES that only you, plays Donkey Kong? That sounds bananas. I mean, we should, <laughs> maybe it only <laughs> plays games really? in the Donkey Kong series. So here's what you do. You get a bunch of old Donkey Kong Country games, peel off the labels, and affix them <laughs> to other games and see if that'll help. <laughs> right. <laughs> trick trick the SNES into thinking that you're playing Donkey Kong Country. It might be like some sort of a weird amiibo thing. It's scanning some part of the label, maybe. Speaking of Amiibo, uh, Nintendo's new president, Tatsumi Kimishima, has said some really interesting stuff about Amiibos. He did a big interview with Time, and Mm -hmm. he talked about how Nintendo was really confused about Amiibo after they released them because they didn't expect people to treat them like collectibles. And, I mean, that's really exactly what we talked about in the Amiibo episode. And he says uh, Nintendo's going to try and put out more Amiibo-centric games, which maybe isn't a good thing, but... yeah. It it still amazes me that they're saying they didn't expect these small plastic action figures, which are traditionally very collectible, mm-hmm. to not be treated as collectibles. Yeah, it's crazy. I almost bought uh, the plushy uh, Yoshi amiibo for a friend who would have no use for it other than as like a collectible. But then it was like seventeen ninety nine. I was like, fuck that. Yeah, we didn't we didn't pay that much for them. Seventeen ninety nine. With the, the holidays and everything, I've, I've noticed that I can go into a store now and see a very well stocked amiibo section. And it's 
almost bewildering to look at to be like oh shit look at all these amiibos that nobody was able to buy for the first year of these things being out and now they're like all here at once Mm -hmm. it's pretty crazy do you think at this point anybody's even given a shit yeah I i think that there are people who want the collection of amiibos because that's how collecting works so now that they're available, they will. I mean, yeah, I think a lot of people who are turned off by the lack of Amiibo situation are going to be like, oh, you know, I can maybe start collecting now. Hmm. And that's, you know, that's a good thing for everybody. Mm-hmm. CD Projekt Red apparently listens to our podcast, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's not CD Projekt Red. It's Matters. So we talked about back in episode two. <laughs> um, it takes a while to get out there. and Yeah. Well, it takes, I mean, it takes a while to make a mod, man. Yeah. Back in episode two, we, we made a joke about how they should replace combat in The Witcher with games of Gwent. Mm-hmm. Somebody made that mod where you can now replace combat with Gwent in The Witcher 3. Yeah, it's uh, pretty interesting, actually. But it's kind of inter- interesting to think, like, how would this game really function in a real world environment? We tried it. and it, We tried it, it didn't because work. we can, you know, spend <laughs> I mean, $16 on the deck. I played in-game Gwent, but... and I liked it more than physical, real-life mm-hmm. Gwent. But, I mean, like, the likelihood that you would come across a peazant who probably could barely afford bread that would have well, some in the Witcher rare books, card. That my, ha- the average person can't even understand how to play Gwent. Though, to be fair, that's in The Witcher 3 mm-hmm. as well when mm-hmm. Gwent is introduced. Mm-hmm. I was just playing The Witcher 3 the other night. So oh, yeah. It's fresh in my head. Yeah. Geralt doesn't know how to play at the beginning of The Witcher 3, and the guy who teaches him to play is unsuccessfully trying to teach to other people. Who plays it predominantly? I forget. The dwarves. The dwarves. And also, depending on which era we're talking about, peasants weren't necessarily poor and destitute. Mm -hmm. 13th century Poland. I don't know enough specific history to know I don't think any of us do. Right. Well, but I mean, just looking at the people in the game, it just seems like... Are they manufacturing these decks for mass production that you can then just go buy like we did? The, the Gutenberg print, printing press has, hadn't been invented yet. Yeah. <laughs> but that's why there's uh, some people have so few cards. They have to go out and kill the monster that has personally scribed down the card. Mm-hmm. And that's it's like, you know, 13th century uh, ganking people for their shoes. Yeah. You know, quick, shoot him in the head. Get his quint card. He's got them Jordans. But I think I let us a little off uh, topic. Um, so Bubsy. Back in an earlier episode, we talked about Bubsy and Bubsy 4 becoming Siphon Filter. And since then, I actually got a chance to talk with Michael Berlin, the creator of Bubsy. And he kind of explained the story to me. And so the way we described it was coming out of a Game of Sutra interview that that he did um, back in the 90s, I believe, or maybe early 2000s. And he was kind of vague about how that fell together. Uh, I got more details on it, though, and it it sounds like he was pitching a lot of things at Mm -hmm. that time. It was Accolade who was really pushing him hard to do Bubsy 4, and he didn't want to do it. He didn't have anything to do with Bubsy too, mm-hmm. and he felt like that tarnished the brand. And then he did work on Bubsy 3D, and he felt like that was, you know, he told me that that was his biggest failure, and mm-hmm. you know, he felt really bad about putting the final nail in the Bubsy coffin with that game. At least he recognized was what happened, <laughs> right? And, and 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 you know, after talking to him, it's it's really clear what ended up happening. Like, you know, they were developing. Bubsy 3D in an era that hadn't ever seen a 3D platformer besides that uh, the French Alpha Waves game, which I'm sure none of them had, had known about. And so you had, you know, Crash Bandicoot, Mario 64, and Bubsy 3D all kind of creating the 3D platform, uh, the 3D platformer in a vacuum. Mm-hmm. And what Mario 64 did ended up being the one that took off. Um, Crash Bandicoot is well regarded, but, you know... We don't have 3D games the way Crash Bandicoot did it. Right. Mm -hmm. Crash I mean, Crash Bandicoot was a very, you know, hallway-esque type Mm -hmm. 3D platformer. Yeah, I mean, I think you could even see comparisons between, like, Bubsy 3D and uh, the original Tomb Raider. I can see that, actually. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, I was playing the new (laughs) re-released version of of Turok Dinosaur Hunter, Mm -hmm. and that came out in 1997 originally, and there's so much platforming in that game, but it's a first-person shooter, and so it's, you know, that stuff was, was in its time very influential.
influential, but we've kind of gotten away from it now. Yeah. But anyway, you know, he Michael Berlin talked about that, and and so the way that we explained it in that episode wasn't exactly accurate. But he was pitching a bunch of uh, mascot type games, and people didn't want to put them out, except for Accolade, who wanted to put out another Bubsy game. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, all of those factors together are what kind of shepherded him into uh, Siphon Filter. Yeah, which is an insane um, segue, I guess you could say. But uh, it's a great interview. It's a great uh, series of articles. It's on uh, Retroevolve.com. You can check that out. I thought it was incredibly fascinating, actually. I mean, to think to go from Bubsy to uh, Siphon Filter. I never played Bubsy as a kid, but I loved Siphon Filter when it originally came out. So that was quite the interview. And with that, uh, I think I'm going to call for a break. Go ahead and thank a couple people, as always, the squad. Um, the crew, 2XAA, Wheelie, cranking out the tunes. I've kind of developed a, a little bit of a dance sequence to go with these, and uh, it's got quite a bit of jumping in it. In fact, that it's really just jumping. It may or may not involve a rope yet. I haven't quite decided. Of course, uh, Retrovolve.com, you know, you can find us there, and uh, a bevy of other articles and, and, and factoids. and uh, All four of us ha- uh, have articles on Retrovolve, so... Mm-hmm. I do need to also say that we have a website of our own called halfglassgaming.com. We recently got a request from a listener to start listing out the games that we mention in every episode, Mm -hmm. which, you know, I think is a great idea. I know some other podcasts do it. And so I've retroactively been, been doing that. And I didn't want to, you know, fill up the Retrovolve page with that stuff. And so all of our episode lists are on halfglassgaming.com. You know, if you're trying to remember a game we mentioned in a specific episode, you can now go on halfglassgaming.com and Mm -hmm. and get a list of games we mentioned in each episode. Yeah, and that's a shit ton of games. I mean, it's upwards of like almost 50 games an episode in in a lot of cases. We we play absurd amounts of games. Yeah, we do. I'm realizing in making these lists, I'm realizing how unhealthy the amount of video games we play actually is. (laughs) <laughs> it's putting it into perspective a little bit. Yeah, I'm, I'm realizing how annoying most of my Facebook posts must be at this point. <laughs> and everybody just assumes that... Uh, Julian, they're no more annoying than talking to you on in face-to-face is. So then it's not annoying at all. That is one interpretation of what I said, yes. <laughs> so with that, we're going to go to break. You know, we're on iTunes, we're on Stitcher. Give us the old five-star rating. Introduce us to your parents, whatever. Um, when we get back, we're going to be getting into some serious business. We're going to talk about games that came out this year. The greatest. We'll be back. All right, welcome back from the breaks. We're all uh, treats excited about getting into a conversation uh, (laughs) regarding games of the year for 2015. Everybody's doing it. You know, we're doing it. It's been a wild, wild ride. 2015. Man, what a year for games. Am I right or am I right or am I right? No, you you are right. This year was ridiculous. And... I'm surprised at how many things I actually did finish this year because this was a year of gigantic freaking games yeah, that massive. were huge and time consuming. Mm-hmm. And some of them uh, weren't finished. <laughs> some of them weren't finished before they were released. So they can't blame me for not finishing the game. <laughs> right. Um, before we get into our list, <laughs> what's the deal with the game awards? <laughs> <laughs> right. The game awards are kind of ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, the name itself is pretty ridiculous. It is. Uh, Spike TV used to do the VGAs, the Video Game Awards. Oftentimes uh, hosted by Samuel L. Jackson. Uh, Jeff Keighley took it upon himself to to do the Game Awards, mm-hmm. which is basically the same thing, only it's run more by people in the industry. And so it's supposed to get rid of a lot of the stuff people had problems with, like, you know, celebrity guests who has no idea what video games are. So they jump to the low-hanging fruit of... Let's make jokes about how all gamers are living in their basement and are virgins. And it's like, well, this is a show for gamers. Mm-hmm. Like, Yeah, and I that- have sex. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a fiancé and two girlfriends. I like, know what sex is. That type of humor maybe floats well with the 
Big Bang Theory watching yeah. crowd, but right. you know, actual gamers don't really want to be made fun of mm-hmm. in events that are supposed to be a celebration of the things that they love. So anyway, uh, yeah, you know, that's the, the Game Awards. The, the the most baffling thing about the Game Awards to me is that they still kept with the early December date, which was always moronic because. Yeah. It's not really the Game of the Year Awards if it doesn't happen once the year is over. Yes. You know, it's like the game of the last 11 months. Mm -hmm. Because you have games like Xenoblade Chronicles X, which was released after they nominated their games. Or you have Yakuza 5, which was (laughs) announced a a day or two after the Game Awards this year. Yeah. And... Maybe it would have been a contender, maybe not. It came out in Japan in 2012. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't a very accurate portrayal of what games were doing at the tail end of 2015. And so all of these games that came out in that last month window were just completely ignored. A lot of these uh, late year release dates are there, I feel, to catch on to the Christmas sale zeitgeist. Uh, and also to get picked up and remembered by the game of the year hype. So, you know, these, these are the fresh games. These are the games people remember, uh, you know, most readily when they're talking about game of the year. So they mentioned them. Well, I mean, I I don't think the game of the year is that big of a driving factor. And when people are putting out games and uh, I think if it was, the problem would be that a lot of games shoot for a November release date, realize, you know, two weeks before launch, like, oh shit, this is going to be a buggy mess. But if we don't get out by November 15th, we're not going to be nominated. Mm -hmm. So let's just put it out and patch Mm -hmm. it later. I don't think that's happening yet. If the Game Awards were more prestigious and held in in higher regard, it absolutely would. I think the best solution is do it in mid-January. You know what happened in 2015. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I think the beginning of the year, you know, just so you can encap, I mean, Just Cause 3 came out on December 1st. The industry completely grinds to a halt in in January, Mm -hmm. which means it's a great time to put out that kind of coverage Mm -hmm. because you don't have anything else to cover. Well, and also because really these award shows are twofold. You know, they do the thing for the, you know, celebration of gaming or whatever, but then it's also just like a way to announce. Yeah, and the timing was particularly terrible this year because PlayStation Experience event began the day after the Game Awards. So nothing was announced at the Game Awards that anybody cared about. And, you know, PlayStation Experience immediately, Yakuza 5 was released um, right after that was announced. Nino Kuni 2 was announced. Which was huge. Yeah, absolutely. So there are these big, exciting announcements that they didn't get because there was another big Mm -hmm. event immediately after. It was just terrible Uh, timing all around. Yeah. Uncharted 4. It's like some new information regarding that. Yeah, they you know, had, that's so. where they announced the dialogue mm-hmm. choices. Mm-hmm. Which Just as a, weird. as a personal curiosity, tell me people are referring to it as Nino Tooney. Please tell me that's happening. No. <laughs> Oh, well, they will now. Not yet, but you know, <laughs> if you want to lead that charge, go but, ahead. Yeah, listen, uh, get the ball rolling. Right? <laughs> my my favorite moment of the Game Awards was when they mistakenly they had a award for best acting, and it went to the woman from her story, mm-hmm. but they credited her as being from The Witcher Three, and so the announcers reading it off the card and like really confused, <laughs> and then like you see the woman like excited, and sitting behind her was one of the devs from CD. Pro- Project Red, and he's just like making the best confused face in the world, like trying to figure out what is happening. Yeah. yeah. Am I lost in translation? I'm Polish. What's happening? Yeah, his date looked like Yennefer, too. Yeah, it was great. The two options that immediately sprung to mind is like he modeled Yennefer after his girlfriend, mm-hmm. or he he's just. He's got a type. <laughs> <laughs> Well, or he just was like, I need to find someone that looks exactly like Yennefer to bring mm-hmm. to the Game Awards this year. And then it got awkward when they went back to the hotel room and he had a stuffed unicorn. <laughs> <laughs> she was like, nice. wait a second, dear. <laughs> Hold on. But no, I uh, I think the, the largest takeaway from the Game Awards, obviously, would be the uh, Hideo Kojima fiasco. Metal Gear Solid Five was nominated for a bunch of awards, and it won Best Action Adventure Game. But uh, Hideo Kojima, who created the Metal Gear series and was the director of Metal Gear Solid Five, was banned from accepting the award by Konami. 
Kojima and Konami parted ways a while back, but Kojima was officially still under contract with the company at that point in time. Yeah, well, Konami I mean, is the worst. Konami's really digging their own grave, I think. You know, let's not do AAA development anymore. Let's, you know, piss on the legacy of all of the properties we've ever made that people like. Yeah. And, you know, we'll just do mobile. And I mean, granted, there is a huge market for mobile and people who are buying a mobile games aren't going to be like, oh, is this a Konami game or not? If it mm-hmm. is, I'm not going to buy it. And so they're probably safe. But in the, the AAA, you know, video game development scene, they're probably not going to be a notable company ever again. Mm-hmm. I just hope they crash and burn so other people can buy their yeah, properties. At this, yeah. Right. At this point, the best thing for gaming that could possibly happen to Konami is that they go bankrupt mm-hmm. and that, you know, THQ style. Kojima's uh, new production company buys the rights back to Metal Gear. And Silent Hill. And, and I was about right, to say. Right. And Silent Hill. Mm-hmm. Or someone else competent by Silent Hill or, you know, and these, these, these big IP get auctioned off. Like that's, that would be the best thing that could possibly happen for gaming to come out of Konami. Mm-hmm. Well, and it's just, it's, you know, a peculiar situation. I mean, sh- there was some sort of a tumultuous breakup apparently, but to deny the guy that kind of created this thing, um, the ability to, you know, accept an award, at least if not for like the property itself, at least for the creation of it. I think is only appropriate. It's not even just like, oh, this new guy came in and invi- and invented this IP that was big for one game. It was like, you know, this guy invented a franchise that has been an important part of gaming history mm-hmm. since the 80s, mm-hmm. and we're not even going to let him accept an award for it. I think everyone's willing to admit that that's complete bullshit. <sighs> who was the journalist there, like, on camera? Who Jeff was Keighley. Jeff Keighley. Yeah. Who no, put the right. event together. JK, my, my homeboy. Right, like, even even Jeff Keighley was just there calling them out like on video yeah. which how often does does that happen that actually? was ballsy and like Keighley's not known no. <laughs> Keighley's specifically Keighley's not known for Doritos really right yeah, for, yeah. for being a ballsy for Doritos is what Keighley is known for right yeah he's like the Carson Daly of the video game world, yeah. I would say and but, so you know even he was calling them out and that, that's how you know you've done fucked up right if yeah. even Jeff Keighley is going to like risk his professional relationship yeah. with your company <laughs> to like call you out like you fucked up yeah cause yeah. Keely whose Twitter used to be a bunch of Mountain Dew TM Doritos TM tweets yeah. well and I mean he was very polite when he did it but it was just like man he put him on full blast yeah. well just... you know sometimes the more polite you sound while you are ripping someone a new one the more devastating it really is mm-hmm. but that's neither here nor there right now now I understand what's up with the Game Awards and I appreciate the, the mm-hmm. little tangent but there, there are some other interesting Interesting Game of the Year awards. I've been kind yeah. of following that religiously. Mm-hmm. I mean, everybody at Red Bull has Game Awards now. <laughs> like, yeah. Red Bull gave it to uh, Witcher 3 and Life is Strange. But, okay. like, Red, freaking Red Bull and, like, Time Magazine has Game of the Year awards. They gave it to an iOS game called Prune, which is hilarious. Yeah, I hadn't me. even heard of that. But, uh, no. Well, it's, it, it's funny because Time is kind of known as, like, uh, only old people read Time. Mm-hmm. Like, let's nominate a game called Prune. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Do you think the fact that there are so many different places and people doing Game of the Year awards just kind of makes them even more pointless? Or do you think they were already kind of pointless to start with and, you know, that's like that's why there's so many? Like, uh, they're like, whatever. No, I think it's great. And I think you're seeing a variety of perspectives. Mm-hmm. My favorite list I've read so far is the New Yorker list. Yeah. And I actually bought two games after reading their list. I bought their Game of the Year, which was Sunless Sea, which is... Is sort of a, a rogue light mm-hmm. game where you're exploring is it the under ocean. London? Yeah, and it's uh, very Lovecraftian, very weird, and like very story heavy, really atmospheric. Mm-hmm. And I bought the Beginner's Guide, which I played and finished, and I can't really talk about, but it was yeah. really. She's under embargo. <laughs> you can't talk about it without ruining it, really. <laughs> yeah. But, but no. uh, it was a very interesting experience, and it did things I've never seen video games do before, and I never mm-hmm. really thought about video games trying to do. And I mean, I, I like that. I like getting so many perspectives. I don't want Game of the Year list to all be the same games everywhere. To me, right. what really shows what a strong year this is, is that how many games are winning, how many games are getting nominated, and I like that there's so many awards with such 
such different perspective. You know, a lot of the people who read Time are probably not big gamers, but mm-hmm. maybe they'll pick up Prune and they'll love it, sure and it'll be an amazing, ex- yeah, and it'll be an amazing experience for them. And you know, the people who read The New Yorker who don't play a lot of games, mm-hmm. and, and it's a Eurogamer writer who did the list for them too. So it's not like mm-hmm. somebody who isn't knowledgeable about games, right. but uh, Simon Parkin, I believe, Simon did Parkin, that list, yeah, who's probably the best person in games journalism, in my well, opinion. Yeah, I, I think. Yeah, I think you know, and I guess I don't know historically how it's gone. You know, say in prior years, if you know the same lists sort of populate different publications or outlets, but um, it's always great when yeah, you can come across a list of games. That, half of which you've never even heard of. Yeah, and as somebody who plays way too many video games and consumes way too much games medium, I'm always, always Mm -hmm. grateful for reminding me that other things exist besides the things Mm -hmm. that everybody talk about. Right, because Simon, his list, you know, were games that he felt sort of were, I guess you could say, like, innovative or doing something Yeah, that's what he specifically said, is that his goal was not just the best games Mm -hmm. that he'd played, but because Mm -hmm. there were so many good games, he wanted to specifically focus on innovation. And I mean, what an interesting list he had and he really justified it all very well which i think actually is um quite different than josh's criteria for game of the year yeah i have a very specific criteria for game of the year and it's the game that best encapsulates the trends of that year or the things that were important about gaming in that year it doesn't necessarily have to be the best game of the year. You know, for example, my my game of the year this year is absolutely The Witcher 3. Mm-hmm. And the reason is I think two of the biggest trends I've I've witnessed in 2015 were one a focus on kind of revolutionizing video game storytelling. I think The Witcher 3 doesn't get as much credit as it deserves for doing that and for how innovative its storytelling actually was. Yeah, seamless. Um, It was. And I mean, the thing that made it great was like, you know, you typically have an open world game and you have, you know, you can say this about GTA, you can say this about Red Dead Redemption, you can say this about the the Batman Arkham games, you can even say this about your your Skyrims, your Fallouts. Mm -hmm. You have side quests that fall into categories. And so it's like in GTA, you've got your main quest, but then you've got your legalized marijuana subquest. You meet that the paparazzi guy, you know you're going to go on a chase and you're going to try to take pictures of celebrities. You start a quest and you know what's coming because you've done quests in that category before. Yeah, Uh, Arkham Knight actually created a wheel of quests. And so everything was categorized in that wheel. And so right away when you're doing a quest, you know which spoke of the wheel it's on. And so it was very, (laughs) it was very, you know, clearly defined groups of quests. But The Witcher 3 took that idea and subverted it. Mm -hmm. And so it was like, these are your types of quests. You know, one type of quest you're going to do is your monster contracts. And so you get three or four monster contracts in and it's like, okay, I get it. You know, I go, I use my Witcher sense, I solve a mystery and then I kill the monster. Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden you come upon like, oh wait, this isn't a real monster. This is a guy pretending to be a monster. (laughs) And then all of a sudden, you know, you go into like an abandoned house where there's supposed to be a a ghost and like there's another Witcher in there and he's like, no, I'm just, you know, spooking people. Like Mm -hmm. I've got a bunch of people trying to kill me. (laughs) And so then all of a sudden you're like going on this crazy adventure with this other witcher to like like to try to kill all of the people that are coming to kill him and like yeah you could start thinking okay this is going to take me 20 minutes i know exactly what i'm going to do and then all of a sudden two hours later you're like somewhere you'd never expected to be and it's like Holy shit, mm-hmm. like I did not see that coming. <laughs> yeah. And it, the Witcher the Witcher 3 does that constantly. Yeah. Quick story. I I don't even know where I was. Uh, I just happened upon a domestic spat that appeared to be a domestic spat going on in this back alley. This guy was like really having at this woman. And I stepped up and I was big tough Geralt and I said you leave this girl alone and he's like I'm out of here. This is too much for me and she's like what the fuck are you doing, man? He's paying me money. <laughs> I'm like a prostitute. He's paying me money to do this. <laughs> and you just fucked that up. You know what I mean? Like, I hope you're happy. And I felt like a complete asshole. <laughs> you know, like a total jerk. Like, I'm sorry. I, you want my money? I don't know what to do here. But that's the thing. is, like CD Projekt Red, when they're creating that game, they very they were very aware of, like, 
these are tropes in the open world genre. Let's acknowledge that these tropes exist, but then let's flip them on their heads. Mm-hmm. Let's let's use these tropes to surprise the player. Yeah. And I think I would I mean I would almost argue that The Witcher 3 is the first open world game that's ever been self-aware enough to to realize it's an open world game and say, okay, how does that affect the story we're trying to tell? And they did it so well yeah. and so seamlessly. The other thing I think games did this year that was really a trend was just these massive open world games. Mm-hmm. And so The Witcher 3 did both of those things. Well, and also games that you may not traditionally consider having a place in the open world genre. Right, right. You know, like, you know, Metal Gear mm-hmm. was a, a series that has never been an open world series, and now it is. The Witcher 3 was the same thing. Mm-hmm. And I think The Witcher 3 surprised everyone because it came out and i think nobody was expecting it Mm -hmm. and like maybe the witcher enthusiasts were but it caught on in a way the other witcher games weren't able to because the witcher was a very niche series before the witcher 3 yeah and it's really cool to see this and i know that you know warner brothers uh financially backed the Mm -hmm. witcher 3 but like you know this little Polish studio comes out of nowhere and yeah. puts out a major AAA game. A major like, that's AAA so game. cool. That's I mean, and now you know among gamers, CD Projekt Red is a house, mm. household name, and like that's so cool. Well, and also, I mean, I didn't come across a litany of bug issues or problems when I was playing. I mean, there were some, of course, but the amount of content that they released for free—not necessarily like earth-shattering content, but the fact that they kept releasing free content every week for 16 weeks keeping you engaged reason to come back as if the game itself wasn't enough you know what i mean but uh and it's interesting because you mentioned arkham knight which i would consider the opposite of innovative in many regards it's almost like they were just checking off the boxes like the the mission wheel the mission wheel almost epitomizes what open world games do wrong Mm -hmm. yeah I was surprised to see it on really anybody's game of the year list, to be honest. Yeah. No, I mean, I'm not going to say it's the worst game I played in 2015. I'll but say it. It's the worst game Mandy's played in 2015. <laughs> it's the game, and then the worst game I've played all year because I played Clicker Games this year, but that was released <laughs> in 2015 yeah. that I played. It was the game I at least enjoyed. Yeah. I think, um, man, I was looking forward to it. So very much, and uh, I wasn't sure about it, and then I really loved it, and then I absolutely hated it. I went through that same exact cycle. It was like, I hated it when I started playing. The Mm -hmm. Batmobile stuff drove me crazy, and I eventually warmed up to it. Exactly. And then I put it down for a week, and I came back to it, and I was like, I can't play this. Like, this is not engaging at all. Yeah. And then I haven't played it since. Mm -hmm. So, Julian, you brought up the uh, matter of The Witcher 3 and its uh, content release. Mm -hmm. In the indie game world, you know, now that indie games are so easy to get to, uh, get, like, there are indie games that are legit contenders for Game of the Year. You've got Life is Strange, Undertale, etc. Well, Life is Strange Um, wasn't an indie game. It was funded by Square Enix. Fair enough. But Undertale definitely is an indie game. Absolutely. And so, like, you've got indie games that are, you know, in people's minds in a way that they weren't in previous years. Mm -hmm. Steam has early access games. How do we consider early access games in terms of game of the year? Well, those aren't complete, are they? That's the idea. They're not complete, but they're complete enough to play. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of an open beta. It's kind of like Minecraft. Right. So, like, how are we considering Minecraft? Like, what what year did Minecraft come out in? Well, they had an official, like... You know, what's it? They did a whole festival. They did, like, this is our official release. Minecraft is is a poor example, but you understand what I'm saying. Mm Mm-hmm. Like how how do how do we consider that unless the developer specifically says you know this is the date I'm I'm saying this game is officially out? I'll just flip that on its head and be and say that it's meaningless. It's like, you know, Minecraft was innovating in 2010. You know, it, it officially launched in 2011, but it was already innovating, already doing things to change the gaming industry in 2010. Well, you know, why wasn't it a game of the year contender? It absolutely deserved to be one. Mm-hmm. Um, here we are, you know, at the end of 2015, and look at everything's fucking influenced by Minecraft now. You know, yeah. you've got Ark Survival Evolved coming out. You've got No Man's Sky coming out. You've got, 
You know, you've got fucking base building inside of a Fallout game. You know, all of these games are taking cues from Minecraft. You know, the survival jo- genre yeah. was reborn because Minecraft was so successful. Yeah, sure, the game that I was, other than Minecraft, I was thinking of is this uh, indie game called The Long Dark, mm-hmm. which officially released on Early Access last year. But, uh, you know, I got it last year for a, a job that I was working. I was supposed to review it. And it was really sparse and not very well put together. And since then, you know, this year they've released patches and upgrades. Now there are multiple areas. It's actually worth exploring. It feels like an entirely different game. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if I... If if you ask me what I thought about The Long Dark in 2014, I'd say, you know, a thin survival uh, simulator that's not very fun. And now, in 2015, I've devoted some 30 hours to it in the past week. But that's, but that's why, I mean, that's why I think the whole thing is meaningless about, oh, when did this come out? It's like, yeah. you know, if it's in early access and doesn't feel like a complete game, it's not going to be nominated for a year, Game of the Year award. Well, I think it transcends that because it's a continuing process that isn't just like... Like, like The Witcher 3 was released in this year, and it was my favorite game of this year. But DayZ or something like right. that, it's well, continuing. And so because of that, my I guess my ultimate question is, do you feel like some of these games that deserve Game of the Year notice and attention don't get it as much because there are people going, well, you know, it's an open beta, so it's not really released. And like then that just keeps happening, and it keeps not quite getting the attention it deserves. Minecraft, of course, is Minecraft. Minecraft will always be mentioned everywhere by everyone. Mm-hmm. But I'm sure that there are some games that, you know, wind up falling into that kind of, you know, crack. Oh, well, it's not officially released, so etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Like, do you feel like that's a thing to pay attention to? I think that's just overcomplicating it. I mean, I think, I really think, was this game important in 2015? You know, it, whether it's an open beta or a complete product, you can answer that question. Mm-hmm. And if yes, then, you know, maybe consider it for a game of the year, even if it's in open beta. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't think the official release date matters if it's if it's an important game in that year. I've seen both Darkest Dungeon and Underrail and uh, Game of the Year award lists. Underrail originally began in 2012, but wasn't officially released until this year. Mm. And I believe the same is true of Darkest Dungeon. So I think when games have an official release past early access and mm-hmm. the official release gets enough attention then it's, they're going to get recognized. I think you can also then call into question remasters. I'd never. I mean, if they've included... If they've exceptionally included... Uh, here. You know, if they included improvements, changes, something that's sort of altered the gameplay if it was important in that year right. you know if you took the original metal gear solid and then remastered it and added a new thing mm-hmm. that became the most influential thing of that year then absolutely because i would say I, I i misspoke earlier when i said when we completed one game this year, i've completed three one of which um was uh, the last of us remastered which i didn't like the first round i fell in love with it the second time and I don't know if that if that was necessarily released this year. I can't re- recall off the top of my head, but it was. So last that's year. remasters released in 2014. Okay, yeah. so I, had at the time, I would have considered that possibly a game of the yeah, year. Yeah, 2014 was a weak year. Yeah, 2014 year, was so. a weak year, and I I officially went on record uh, at the end of last year and mm-hmm. said that uh, Super Smash Bros mm-hmm. was my game of the year for yeah. 2014. Oh, then it must have been weak. And <laughs> <laughs> no, it, Smash Smash Bros was great, um, but it didn't gotcha, do. Yeah. It didn't do anything important or innovative. I mean, for the Smash Brothers franchise, yes, absolutely, it mm-hmm. did. Mm-hmm. It pushed the franchise forward. I mean, and it did. It you know blew blew up the whole amiibo thing, which mm-hmm. wasn't that innovative either because Skylanders <laughs> had been doing it for years. Yeah. Uh, had I played Far Cry Four to completion by the end of 2014, uh, I, did, I actually didn't play it until this year. Uh, I might have nominated that mm-hmm. as as the game of the year. I think if you watch all three endings and you have an understanding of how to get each ending it's one of the most brilliant games mm-hmm. i've ever played i'm fascinated still yeah and far I mean, cry 4's endings are so good never got through to the end i had a lot of complaints about the game and it was really me more me poking fun than mm-hmm. serious complaints but like 
if you see all their endings, it really addresses them, and you see like that a lot of the things that just seem like bad writing that the gamers are doing are intentional. So really saying some clever things about video games as a medium, I'm mm -hmm. fascinated by Far Cry 4. It's intentionally a badly written game in the way that every game is a badly written game. And at the very end, if you see all three endings, it completely addresses that. And it is like, look, you know, we're pulling the rug out from under you and we're, we're you know, self-aware. Like we weren't telling a phenomenally written story. We were telling a stereotypical video game story, mm -hmm. but we did it in order to show you something about video game storytelling. And it was really great. And I don't want to spoil it, but... Mm -hmm. You know, I I would encourage everyone who's playing Far Cry 4 to push through to the end and then, yeah. you know, at least like YouTube the other two endings. Mm -hmm. Are there any games that, you know, specifically you guys would like to mention? Give some honorable mention to? Sure. All right. Uh, okay. So, well, everybody's gone to the rapture. Everybody feel free to chime in uh, with your thoughts and opinions. Everybody's Gone to the Rapture isn't one of my favorite games of this year, but I think it probably had the most powerful scene mm -hmm. I experienced I've seen in it on any a couple game lists. this year. Uh, Everybody's Gone to the Rapture was a very interesting game from a storytelling perspective. And, you know, it's like I said earlier... This is a huge year for games that are doing things with storytelling that we didn't really anticipate. Mm -hmm. That makes that just an interesting game to, to put on a list of, mm -hmm. you know, this is another game that did storytelling in an interesting, innovative way this year. Mm -hmm. No, Josh and I, after we finished Everybody's Gone to the Rapture, we had a really intense, really weird, but very cool conversation for probably at least two hours just debating character motivations. Yeah. And I liked that we could do that about a video game. Well, that's a, a sign of a good game. A good anything, really, that it sort of encourages conversation after it's ended. Excellent voice acting, too. I actually mm -hmm. oh, yeah, the played, voice acting. played oh, Soma gosh. right after everybody's gone to the rapture, and I feel like I would have liked Soma a lot more if I had not played a game with such good voice acting before mm -hmm. it. Right. A lot of people are bummed that Soma isn't making anyone's game of the year list this year. I didn't beat Soma, so I wonder if maybe the ending is something really cool the way Far Cry 4 was. Mm -hmm. I mean, I liked it. I just it didn't feel amazing to me and I wound up bouncing off it because I just had too much to play this year. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody gone to the rapture. rapture. Let me ask you. Aliens? <laughs> was it Aliens? It was, it was Xenomorphs. Well, speaking of Xenomorphs, I'm going to jump right into Xenoblade Chronicles X. I love Xenoblade Chronicles X. Yeah. I, I don't know if it's a, my game of the year, but I don't oh, think I've it's seen so it much fun. On any list, it was it actually Well, it time, came out after the nominees came out, and that's, yeah. that's why it's on no one's list. The time put out their list on December 1st. Mm -hmm. Xenoblade Chronicles X came out on December 4th. Like a week later, Time put out a list, best RPG of 2015, <laughs> like because they had to get it in there. Yeah. Cause, so it really showed one of the major issues of mm -hmm. putting out those lists too early. But it actually yeah. has showed up, been showing up on some lists. And mm -hmm. I mean, what I like the most about Xenoblade Chronicles X is what it does is the Earth was blown up. It's sort of very beginning of Battlestar Galactica in that humanity is on these survival ships. And so your ship crash lands on this planet. It. Yeah, you're, you're Starbuck. <laughs> if only. <laughs> Starbuck's my favorite. Yeah. But, uh, so you crash land on this planet. You have to try to keep humanity going, explore this dangerous planet, get the resources mm -hmm. you need. But uh, it's not the traditional type of story you'd see in video games. It feels very much structured like a TV show. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's like the character driven episode about, oh, we're having problems with this part. And you go out to find the part and then the character like winds up admitting all these emotional things to you but then you have the big story heavy action heavy episode that's maybe like a season finale and I like that I think that's a really smart way to structure stories in video games and yeah. it has really super fun gameplay and it's really beautiful it's the biggest open world release this year to the best of my knowledge and you're of huge open worlds according to the games director the world mm -hmm. is actually as big as Japan <laughs> I've explored only a tiny percentage of it it's it's beautiful it's, it's really cool. Their corners cut, but, you know, it's a Wii U game, mm -hmm. so that they made something that big and that cool looking mm -hmm. on the Wii U. It says a lot. I'm mm -hmm. glad it's getting some recognition, at least. I haven't played it, but I watched, you know, I've been watching over Mandy's shoulder as she plays it and just runs around and gasps at, like, 
the scale of these really well designed monsters. Yeah. You know, you see like this massive cliff off in the background with like palm trees on top of it, and all of a mm-hmm. sudden it like starts walking around, mm-hmm. and you've got monsters so big that other monsters are living on them. And there, like, there's a, a monster I walked up to, it and I'm smaller than its toenails. <laughs> like that's how big the monsters are in this game. It kind of reminded me, and, and maybe this is just not a fair uh, comparison, but it reminded me of um, like Monster Hunter. Yeah, yeah, I can see that, and the battle system is very different, but it's actually even like Monster Hunter that you can team up with people online mm-hmm. to fight the really huge, really giant monsters. Yeah. And it reminds me the most of Fantasy Star Online, which I always played <laughs> offline, <laughs> but uh, it's very much got a, that offline MMO vibe. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I know you could play it online, but I never did, so I think of it as an offline MMO. No, it's really cool. I really liked it a lot. I recommend it if you have a Wii U or a boyfriend with a Wii U. Yeah, I don't have a why <laughs> josh will you be my boyfriend i'm already doing that boyfriend thing yeah well, so uh, you know polyamory is a thing <laughs> i'll uh, i'll stick with the wii u and i'll go with the surprise shooter contender for the year splatoon splatoon was an interesting game because it was it was a shooter aimed at little kids mm-hmm. you know at a, a, shooter a very <laughs> aimed at little kids that it's, sounds it's dangerous. call and of duty for kids and <laughs> it i mean really, yeah it, it really is and call it, of duty <laughs> <laughs> Why am I laughing so much? It's a because joke. poop is funny. Because poop is funny. I'm the worst. <laughs> but no, it's 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 a really fun, interesting game, mm-hmm. and you know, someone finally took the basic mechanics of the multiplayer shooter and was like, "How can we make this not violent and you know safe for kids and still approachable?" you know, enough Mm. for kids and they figured out a way and it's, you know, you have guns filled with paint and your entire goal is to paint more of the map Mm. than your opponents. And so you've got two, two teams, both painting with different colors and, you know, you can paint over other teams paint. Mm. And so you're, you're constantly trying to paint as much of the map as you can. And it's, it's really fun. They've been constantly supporting it with content. And a lot of people complained about it in the beginning saying, oh, it's so late on content. Why is none of the content out yet? And it's like, well, because. (laughs) She doesn't like that guy. (laughs) (laughs) Because. That's how you keep a community interested long term in a, in a mm-hmm. multiplayer game. And with with like Nintendo knows the Wii U install base isn't very big, mm-hmm. and so in order to keep an active community, you've got to do something extra special. Mm-hmm. And so what they've been doing is releasing free content, holding events, doing all kinds of stuff that makes it a game that like oh I haven't played this in two months, but it's still going to be worth mm-hmm. while to jump into it and you know experience this new event. And yeah. it was a really smart game in a lot of ways uh the one thing that frustrated me about it and i think you know i assume they're gonna address this if they make a sequel to it but Mm -hmm. like you can't play with two players simultaneously like with call of duty Mm -hmm. you can play split screen and i i do that i actually play that way a lot if they had done that i think a lot more people i mean i certainly put in a ton of yeah if mandy and i could play together we would have we would have put so much time into that game but we couldn't yeah i mean you're a kid now you're a squid now (laughs) (laughs) it's everybody's fantasy now that actually that that'll uh, lead me to um another shooter that uh, according to a majority of the internet completely bungled the way they handled not enough maps uh battlefront Star Wars Battlefront is the game is one of the games I spent the most time with this year. Just awful. I bet I invested over a hundred hours in that game, and I could, I plan on to keep playing it. I have a lot to say about it, but I'm mm. not going to say that in this episode. We'll wait till next week. We'll wait till next week. And <laughs> I have a feeling that's going to be a Battlefront heavy conversation <laughs> next week. Look forward to it, folks. Look forward to it. I haven't played any of these games really, um, but uh, but one that is really blowing up is Rocket League. Rocket League is fascinating yeah. to me because Rocket League is a remake. Does but I think it is a very important game this year, mm-hmm. and especially in the multiplayer scene. And it's it's doing a lot of things that are very interesting and very innovative mm-hmm. and very, I think, uh, in the long run are going to be viewed as important. Mm-hmm. Um, so this one I think Reverend's going to have a, a little bit to say about Undertale. It's interesting to me because Undertale is a game that showcases how 
fucking bizarre uh, my game playing habits are, uh, which I can only attribute to ADHD, but, you know, who the fuck knows. What What is it that you like about the game? Uh, what I really like, other than the kind of retro throwback vibe to it, is that it's a really great example of trying to find new ways to tell uh, traditional stories. So it's it's very much a, a you know an RPG in in the the same realm as your Earthbound, etc. Uh, in fact, you can really see a lot of the Earthbound uh, traces and inspirations in there. Mm-hmm. Toby Fox is actually uh, started out making Earthbound mods. He made the Earthbound Halloween mod, which is probably one of the best known Earthbound ROM hacks. It does this thing where you don't have to fight a single monster. You talk to them. You try to figure out how to, you know, get it to where they are friendly. Mm-hmm. You and set them up with other characters. You set them up with other characters. Talk them out of their dog armor. Right. (laughs) You know, when I first heard about that, I was like, so how the fuck do they put in any kind of tension? Well, you know, it's because it's not based on getting your stats higher than the other, the monsters. It's based on kind of a bullet hell thing where you're moving your heart around. Mm. Uh, So like, and that's really interesting. That's a great way to do it. It allows the monster characters to be so much more part of the narrative even the you know random battles that usually you would just spam the a button and like can we get cinderay the- plane yeah. oh you you haven't gotten to cinderay plane because you haven't played yeah i probably haven't part. i've i've uh cinderay gotten- plane is my favorite random enemy in the game i don't know what's happening <laughs> I've, I've gotten uh just past the first time you see papyrus mm-hmm. uh with undyne but so like it it makes even the random battles feel like they're part of the narrative in a way that games of that style, which I think we decided to no longer call JRPGs anymore, <laughs> um, like they don't usually have. So it's very wonderful in that front. Mm-hmm. Is it a Japanese game? It, no, it, it was not. made by Toby Fox. Uh, he made almost the entire game by himself. And it was, you know, in like even in the Game Awards, it was up against games like The Witcher 3, like big AAA games. <laughs> yeah. This game that one guy made. Uh, it does something very different by having a sort of Shin Megami Tensei mechanic where you can talk and reason to the monsters, but it does it so much better than any game I've ever seen in that it's the hardest option to take. Absolutely. You get no experience points if you talk your way out of a fight. If you don't fight, you're going to be level one the entire game Mm -hmm. with 20 HP. And I mean, there are exploits that you can do to get a little more HP, but you know, it puts so much work into making you care about the characters you're fighting, even random enemies, that you really feel like it's the wrong thing to do. You can play the game and kill every single character you come across. Mm -hmm. Uh, In fact, there's an enemy you can only get. Yes. Mm -hmm. There's an enemy you can only get if you kill everybody. But, like, it makes me nauseous to even think about it. Like, there are parts of the game I could never experience because it would be too upsetting for me because they put so much work into creating level characters you'll care about. I think Papyrus is my video game character of the year, 2015. <laughs> Whoa, above Nick Valentine? Oh, I don't know. It's oh. tough competition. <laughs> but, uh... I think that's valuable. I like when games say, well, you can do this thing that's easier or you can do this thing that's harder and more of a pain Mm -hmm. and kind of frustrating Mm -hmm. and then make you want to choose the more frustrating Mm -hmm. option for reasons beyond just, you know, Mm -hmm. bragging rights or challenge. It's like uh, Dishonored. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I was talking to Josh yesterday. There are at least three games I played this year where, like, being nice to a dog was of strategic benefit to me. Was one of them Life is Strange? Uh, yes, one of them was Life is Strange. Okay. One of them was Until Dawn. One of them was Undertale. And mm. I guess you could argue that about Fallout 4, mm. too, but I wouldn't. Uh, oh, yeah. Quick question. The bunny goat. Toriel. Toriel. Uh, if you actually choose to fight her, did you kill her? Is that how yeah, the narrative goes? Yeah, you can kill Toriel. Which is another thing that the game does that's really interesting and different. Because in a lot of games, uh, you know, in that JRPG style, you would have the fight. And if you fight the NPC, you know, afterwards, the NPC is fine. In Undertale, like, here's this character that wants you to fight her to prove that you can actually survive outside of her care. 
and you could talk her out of it, or you could fight her, and apparently if you fight her, you actually kill her. Well, mm-hmm. to take that another level, if you fight her and kill her and then say, oh, I wish I didn't do that and start the game over, the game will taunt you and remind you that you killed her in your last playthrough and be like, you can start over, but it doesn't change that. That still happened. I mean, she's not nice. dead in that play for right, but the but game will taunt you, you about mm-hmm. it. Which so yeah, it's it's really doing new things and interesting things with the narrative experience that the player has with the game. Thus, even more evidence for my point. You know, backing up my Witcher Three is the game of the year because you know <laughs> this it's it's another game that takes the tropes of its genre, is aware of those tropes, and then subverts them in order to tell a more interesting story. Yeah, and that's a very you know an important thing that games are doing. This Year. Well, and I think what's also important is that so many games leading up to this point, larger AAA games, let's say, have given you this black and white uh, morality scale. You know, like I think Mandy equated it to feeding puppies to homeless children or something. <laughs> yeah, like rescue puppies or <laughs> like force feed puppies to homeless children. Yeah, right. That's right. like that's what Infamous feels like for sure. Exactly. So there are so many uh, times uh, in The Witcher where you're like, okay, I'm tough guy, shining knight. I'm gonna do this, and then it just completely blows up in your face. You know, like I, I, I wandered upon a guy and uh, he was tied up and he was left to be killed by the monsters, and uh, he seemed like an honest Joe, so I let him go. And hours into the game down the road i run across him and his band of men just slaughtering and doing all sorts of terrible things to these villagers i just felt so betrayed i accidentally saved the life of a serial killer in yeah. fallout 4 <laughs> did you do that too i did actually yeah i just walk in see people fight i'm like oh, oh be- Caleb, that that guy's guy's he's like oh yeah i can't remember his he name and like then you really he has like a, yeah and like he gives you a note it's like thanks, <laughs> thanks killer yeah. <laughs> <laughs> see, and and that's where to you know compare it back to Skyrim, which is the open world game I have the most uh, experience with, that's what Skyrim feels like it doesn't do. Mm -hmm. Like, you don't really affect the narrative in any real way. Mm -hmm. You know, you save someone's life and then that's it. You get the quest reward. Yeah, I think Witcher, you affect the narrative and the narrative affects you. I heard somebody talk about breaking Yennefer's heart and then not being able to play the game anymore because they felt too bad about it. Yeah, I felt like a jerk when I was sleeping with prostitutes and... <laughs> oh, what a great sentence! I mean, I'm doing it. Josh, you know? I like how Josh, Josh, like, I'd come out to watch you play and he'd, like, go to find a girl to have sex with in the video game. <laughs> Just because it's funnier to him, probably. I mean, I threw a baby in an oven, okay? <laughs> 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 and it was the right thing to do. Right? <laughs> <laughs> what a great, what a great game. Yeah. Uh, you know, the real proof that Witcher Three is game of the year is that the opening shot has a chicken in it. <laughs> oh, no, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, I can't, I cannot argue with that. Yeah. Okay. This one. <sighs> I don't know where I stand on this one. Metal Gear Solid 5. Metal Gear Solid 5 is getting, you know, nominated for Game of the Year award a lot. You Left know, and right. It pains me. It fandom pains me to say. <laughs> as much as I love the Metal Gear series, I don't think Metal Gear Solid 5 should be a nominee because it's not a finished game. It's Kojima's last game with Konami. It's the last game, mm-hmm. you know. Last game fans are going to consider as canon in the Metal Gear Solid universe, and it's not finished. You can see, as you get into the second half of it, you can clearly see that this is not a finished product. I'm all of a sudden in the middle of a story mission, and I'm being forced to replay a story mission from the first part of the game. All of the cutscenes are still there, Mm -hmm. implying it's supposed to take place in the beginning of the game, yet... I'm, you know, 50 hours into the game, and here's me replaying an old mission Mm -hmm. for apparently no reason. They don't really justify that at all. The frustrating thing for me is I can start to see some of what I believe is Kojima's intent for the game, and it just isn't there. Mm -hmm. And my understanding is that... Those missions that are just repeats of old missions would have actually been new missions Mm. uh, had they finished the game. Mm -hmm. There was supposed to be – there's two parts to the game right now. There was supposed to be a third, and the third was supposed to go into a lot of big bosses' relationship with the boss – 
I believe the boss's essence or like, you know, mind is basically mm-hmm. in that like robotic machine. And so I think there was going to be some really important revelatory stuff. And this was supposed to be the game where we see a big boss transfer from being the good guy, being the hero, to being the villain of the series. And we really didn't see that. Mm -hmm. And so toward the end, you start having these really weird, you know, torture scenarios where you're torturing people. And it's like, that doesn't feel like it belongs there even. Mm -hmm. And I I believe there was supposed to be more. There was supposed to be a transition there. That Well, I mean, it's pretty much confirmed, isn't it? Because there's a whole cut scene that you can't get to in the game. Right. There's a whole cut. I mean, there's a whole cut mission that was supposed to take place after the final mission that's actually in the game. Mm-hmm. And that was on like a making of DVD or something. Mm-hmm. And you can you can kind of see it and they've kind of re-pieced it together, but it gives you more of the story. And so you can see that there was more of the story that they just weren't allowed to make. Mm-hmm. You know, Konami was like, you know, fuck you, we're cutting your budget and pushing this out the door. And we're also pushing you out the door. Yeah, like, yeah, don't let the door hit you with a good Lord split you. <laughs> it's so frustrating because, you know, that had the potential to be one of the best games ever made. Mm-hmm. If Kojima would have been allowed to finish it and he wasn't. I really have a hard time. You know, it's like I said with the Skyrim thing. I have a hard time nominating a game that was clearly unfinished as a game of the year mm-hmm. contender because mm-hmm. it wasn't even finished. Do you think a lot of those audio tapes were like dialogue just cut from cutscenes they couldn't fit in there? Josh and I were just talking about it the other day, how with older games, if you could, ran out of money, like with Xenogears, you could sort of fake it, like how Xenogears is just people basically talking over stills mm-hmm. for a large chunk of the game to get the story out if, if they took a lot of cutscenes and made them into audio tapes. Yeah. I actually... The same thing. I actually don't think that's the case because the Metal Gear series always had the really lengthy, you know, conversations and things that always kind of took place as an as a separate element from the rest of the game where mm-hmm. you're you're just looking at the codex screen and having, you know, two hour conversations. And I think because it was an open world and because they didn't want to bog the player down with all of that stuff, they they just you know, put it into the cassette tapes. Mm -hmm. And I think that was a brilliant idea for the game. They could have probably done more with it. They could have put more of the story into those tapes and actually made it feel maybe slightly more finished. But, you know, as it stands, the game wasn't finished. And even Kojima's admitted as much. And, you know, he's made some snarky comments about Konami and, like, the next game I make will be finished and Mm -hmm. things like that. And so it's like he clearly didn't feel like he finished his game. I think for me, I enjoy the game mechanics. I think they're super solid. I mean, I loved playing it. I, I got to the end and I felt very frustrated and kind of betrayed. Mm-hmm. But the gameplay was very solid. The A lot of the ideas in the game were very, very good ideas. Mm-hmm. And that, that makes it even more frustrating yeah. that it wasn't finished because the potential to be even greater than it was, was there yeah. and was intended. And squandered. Right. And Konami wouldn't allow it to exist. Just and that's ex-girlfriend. <laughs> exactly. You know, she knew she'd never find anyone better. <laughs> so she just got bitter. It's it's unusual, though, because I don't I think it is not unfinished in the way almost any other game is mm-hmm. unfinished. I mean, there's a complete game yeah. within Metal Gear Solid Five. If you just... cut it off after the end of part one, it's done. It's Would've a finished great. game. Game. Would have been fine. And they could have, you know, pushed the rest of that material into a sequel. Or that you could have just used that as like, what do they call those things in Batman? Um, time trial type. Yeah. Uh, and that's kind of what they, they did, like, except there was still story. They forced it upon you in order to get to whatever arbitrary ending they had finally c- come up with. I well, guess. yeah, and I think all of that, the the additional, you know, extra hard versions of missions you've already played was supposed to be optional content. Mm-hmm. But they got forced to put it in the game because the game was missing pieces and they had yeah. to fill it in. Like their VR missions. Mm, not really. <laughs> I have no not like they are VR missions, but like these optional sort of challenges. Well, like, like in how in Ground Zeroes, once you beat the game, you've mm-hmm. got, you know, a bunch of optional challenges. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but those have stories to them. You're freeing Hideo Kojima in one of them. Um, he's a captured friend of ours and you got to get him out and 
Right, but they're not like canon stories. Well, I don't know about no. I guess not. Either way, like you could you could have put them out as optional content, and they would have been fucking great. Mm-hmm. But you had to play through them in order to see the story, and the story stopped making sense once that those you know became essential parts of the story. Mm-hmm. All right, so this one's going to be contentious. I think it's the biggest game for me of the year, even though it's not my favorite game of the year. Fallout Four. I mean, it's what not. Dealio? It's not one of my game of the years, but I loved it. They took out some of the stuff I really like from Fallout Three, mm-hmm. but I also think it was a super fun game. Mm-hmm. I had a lot of fun with Fallout 4. I just, I don't feel like it did anything that was all that innovative. No. Uh, it added base building, which is a cool thing for the Fallout series to have, but it really didn't do that much that was, you know, mm-hmm. that big of a step forward. You know, it didn't encapsulate the things that I think were important about gaming this year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think for me, what it did really was just allow me to enjoy even more the things that I enjoyed from the previous games. Yeah. The dialogue options aren't as good and no. charisma isn't as important. And I actually, my last Fallout 3 run, I was playing without killing anything, a mm-hmm. complete pacifist oh, run. Really? And that's impossible in Fallout 4. Yeah. But it's absolutely possible absolutely, in Fallout yeah. 3. Uh, you know, I've been able to like save people's lives through talking, but I haven't been able to like do something. You know, you can talk your way out of a final boss fight in Fallout 3. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you can't do that and Fallout 4 and I missed that but it's a really fun game it's just in a weak year being a really fun game could be enough to be a game of the year but in a yeah, strong year right. absolutely not point. but I mean I loved it I'll play it a lot more I already mm-hmm. played it a lot I will say um, I didn't mention this earlier but I wanted to give an honorable mention to uh, Mad Max which I thought really was just killed by its release date um, yeah. that game had has a lot of promise and has a lot of interesting qualities to it and it's just visually gorgeous and I had yet to play uh, just cause 3 because you know fuck I have time and a life and I need to work and <laughs> it just escapes me um, I did not like life is strange. Didn't get into it. Well, I think Life of Strange is actually probably my game of the year. And yeah. I've thought about it a lot and gone back and forth and all over the place. And I haven't beat some other games that are mm-hmm. contenders. Mm-hmm. But the uh, thing about Life is Strange for me is that it kind of made me mis- nostalgic about things that never happened. It really nailed strange. some weird things about being a teenager. And then it mixed it with this sort of fantasy stuff. And I don't even mean the time travel elements. When I was a teenager, I actually applied to an arts boarding school Mm. similar to the one that's in life is strange i wanted to go to interlochen arts academy and so it's like this version of my teenage life that i imagined having but still with all the awkwardness and cringiness i really liked that they weren't afraid to be cringy and super corny because that's how i talked when i was a teenager i was the corniest kid in the world like (laughs) that stupid stuff at the beginning with like Max always being like that real hero stuff and like that's the sort of stuff I did when I was a teenager and it embarrasses me to see it (laughs) but in a good way and I mean no disrespect to don't nod when I say this (laughs) it reminds me of the old purple moon games (laughs) they were games that got a huge grant to try and make video games for girls and they were some of the earliest visual novels released in the west they're not good games, but mm-hmm. I had a lot of fun with them. It was really cool to have something that wasn't Barbie that was made for girls mm-hmm. back in the 90s. And so it feels a little like that, like this weird high school choice making experience with some supernatural mechanics mixed in because you could hear people's thoughts in the Purple Moon games. Oh, okay. That I like that somebody took something terrible from my childhood that I liked and made it into something good. <laughs> I love that Life is Strange exists. Uh, I haven't really gotten past, like, the first 15, 20 minutes of the first episode. But even playing that much, I can recognize all this really interesting stuff in there. Uh, You know, narrative-wise, gameplay-wise. Like, it's all really neat. And I am happy that it it exists in this world. It 
did things that I think a lot of the Telltale games have been trying to do for years and haven't been able to exactly pull off yet. And I think Life is Strange took the choice-based narrative formula and and really perfected it. I would say the same thing about Until Dawn, for the record. Yeah, that's, that's probably fair. Until Dawn helped me realize really what I don't like about David Cage games. <laughs> like, it helped me to articulate it in a better way because I think... David Cage's whole thing is trying to make games that feel like movies. I mean, and Until Dawn is one of the purest movie games I've ever played. It's written it's written and directed by a horror movie writer and director. It's absolutely just you're playing a horror movie. Mm-hmm. But they sort of thought about what can we do to enhance a horror movie by making it playable. And like that's what David Cage doesn't think about. And horror is the ideal genre for this because it's probably the genre people are most famous for yelling at the screen because characters are doing stupid things. Mm -hmm. And until dawn, I will spoil this because I think it makes the game better. Everybody can live or everybody can die. Right. And that's on the box too. So I mean, oh, okay. So (laughs) I haven't even looked at the box (laughs) and I own the game. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, you know, taking these characters who you're going to be yelling at like why are you making this stupid decision and yeah. like putting those decisions in your hands right. and seeing what uh, you would actually do and then you look like an idiot because you <laughs> got the same uh, results right there. at the end of my first playthrough one of my favorite characters I got them killed and I knew I knew what I was doing I was going to get them killed because I've watched a million horror movies and I'm like why am I doing this but I was too curious and I did it like that's a good feeling I liked that I liked having that no and I super massive who made Until Dawn sort of came out of nowhere Until Dawn was a crappy little move game for the PS3 that nobody really was that invested in and then it got pushed back seemingly cancelled comes out of nowhere for the PS4 and just a fantastic Mm -hmm. game and like that's really cool i'm really excited to see what both don't nod and super massive do next because i love adventure games i love choice games and i think they both did really cool it's got motherfucking hayden penetier in that shit i know hayden penetier word from agents of shield yeah the guy uh, from uh, Need for Speed movie. <laughs> who looks like Bruno Mars. Oh, yeah. Who else is in the... Oh, the guy from Mr. Robot, Rami something. It also, Until Dawn, scares the pants out of Josh, which yeah. makes it a great game. Josh, you have pants inside of you. <laughs> scares the pants out of Josh. <laughs> you need those... You need those pants exercise. <laughs> it's just Josh makes fun of you for being scared all the time. Yeah. So it is fun to see him squeal like a little girl mm-hmm. well, over but, something jumping out at a bit of video game. It's good times. And it is because he's the kind of guy who can handle Bloodborne. A, a, a little bit. I mean, I I did play and enjoy Bloodborne this year. I don't think it's a game of the year, mm-hmm. you know, primarily because of the reasons that I mentioned before is I don't think it did anything that was all that important. It did tell a story in a very interesting way. So there's that. Mm-hmm. Um, but it wasn't really a thing that the Dark Souls games hadn't already done. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think it's a fantastic game. I think it's a fantastic refinement of the things that Dark Souls was doing right. I I just don't think it's going to be a hugely influential game, and I don't think it encapsulates the most important elements of what was happening this year in gaming. Mm -hmm. And, you know, not to say I didn't like it, because I loved it, and I played the crap out of it, but for me, it it doesn't meet my criteria for Mm -hmm. Game of the Year. Well, I mean, I think, yeah, like you had mentioned, sort of this, the larger tier games kind of were sort of following this trend, open world, um, massive games. But, you know, on, on the indie side of it, um, you got games like Her Story. I loved Her Story. And one of the really cool things about this year, I played two really good, really fun FMV games. <laughs> like, what a weird genre to see a resurgence. Yeah. Uh, I also played Contradiction, which is very corny, but super fun, and I, I recommend it. Mm-hmm. But uh, her story is great because it's some of the most interesting detective work I've ever done in mm-hmm. a video game. Usually in video games, when you have to solve mysteries, like,
like, they straight up show you the clues because they are making it more gamey. And uh, her story made it less gamey. You just, you watch videos and then you try to figure out what to search for in a police database next based on what you've seen. And so the story can unravel in any order based on what you choose to search for. Mm. But I mean, you really had to think about it and pay attention to what she was saying and think about what would lead you to important information that would help you solve this mystery. Like, it was all up to you. If mm-hmm. you couldn't think of anything to search for, the game would be over. And I mean, I never ran out of anything to search for, yeah. but I liked that. It was genuine detective work, and it was the type of detective work I'd never done. What a great year. Okay, and so with that, I think I'm going to call, uh, well, for another break. Uh, we're going to stretch our legs and uh, decompress. Um, I would like to uh, wish a, a happy new year to uh, Liam Padmore and my main man, Jimmy Mamatis. When we get back from this uh, second break, I know it's weird. It's weird saying it, and I'm sure it's weird hearing it. But uh, when we get back from our second break, we're going to wrap things up and um, do a little time traveling. And we're back. Whew, that was a much deserved uh, walkabout. Uh, I'm going to get the blood circulating again. I've been hunched over this microphone for what seems like ages. Yeah, so let's take you back to a time, a simple time, when you'd find pies cooling in windowsills and children hopscotching. 1995. <laughs> well, so the thing about looking at retro games and talking about the game of the year is that now you have an additional thing that you start to pay attention to. Uh, it's not just what games were really well made that year. Uh, it's not just what games encapsulated what gaming was doing that year, but it's also uh, what games have a legacy. Really, for me, trying to decide a game of the year is trying to do some prediction on what game is going to leave the biggest legacy. Sure. But, you know, with the hindsight of 20 years, you can start seeing what game left the biggest legacy. Because it's not always the one you'd think. As as a great example, uh, both Super Mario World 2, Yoshi's Island, and Donkey Kong Country 2, Diddy, Diddy's Kong Quest, came out in 95. And those were fantastic games. They are fun. They are really well made. They are amazing platformers, and that's about all anybody talks about when they talk about them. However, you've also got Earthbound and you've got Chrono Trigger that came out that year, Mm -hmm. and probably no one expected this non-Final Fantasy, you know, 15-hour RPG uh, from Square to be the game that 20 years later is still defining the JRPG genre, but here we are. Mm. Well, let's not forget about Worms. Right, I no, love everyone worms. everyone knows that worms had the biggest impact on the history of gaming ever. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I love worms. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. the series is still alive. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's still thriving. Yeah. Still but, worming all over the place. Yeah. <laughs> fuck, fuck you. So, so you kind of have to look at that. Or with Earthbound. I mean, Earthbound was not well received when it came out. Uh, for the games of its time, it wasn't really that impressive, except in terms of it had this entertaining and interesting narrative. Bubsy was way higher reviewed Bubsy, than Bubsy Earthbound was. was. Bubsy was way higher reviewed. Yeah, for good reason. Uh, it is 1995. Uh, right, exactly. But now, well, Bubsy was 93. But, I'm saying right now it's 1993. Right now, yeah. But, uh, but now, you know, you look back on the effect that Earthbound has had on gaming, on, you know, narratives in gaming, mm-hmm. on the the modern game things, you know, with Earthbound clones, like Mandy was saying. It obviously had a much bigger effect on gaming than Donkey Kong Country 2 had, mm-hmm. than Super Mario World 2 Yoshi's, Yoshi's Island had. The original PlayStation came out in 1995. And so what was happening in 1995 was that the seeds were being sown for a completely new type of gaming experience. Mm -hmm. Throughout the next few years, gaming was about to start seeing a transition from 
you know, 2D sprites to 3D polygons. And that would have a huge effect on gaming because genres that couldn't have existed before are now coming into fruition. Mm -hmm. The 3D platformer would stumble in the beginning, but eventually would, you know, find its way and then Mm -hmm. would kind of, you know, phase itself out. But You know, you're having experiences like Twisted Metal 2, which I suppose you could say is sort of like, you know, Mario Kart or something like that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe could have worked with, you know, Mode 7 technology or whatever, but it really was able to thrive in the 3D environment. Yeah, and I think with uh, the arrival of the PS1, um, that's when I got to experience genres that I hadn't previously been introduced to. RTS, Command and Conquer. To clarify, Twisted Metal 2 actually came out in 1996. And I just use it as an example because it's my personal favorite one. Twisted Metal 1 did actually come out in 1995, though. Uh, Also, you know, speaking to the RTS thing, that... The RTS wasn't brand new in 1995, but 1995 was a great year for for the RTS genre. I mean, Warcraft 2 came out that year. Warcraft 2 is probably my most played game of 1995. I used to just come home from school and play Warcraft 2. I had all the cheats memorized because (laughs) I was impatient. So I'd, you know, queue up my buildings and make it so. Wasn't getting my money fast enough. Glittering prize. Glittering what? Glittering prize is the money cheat from Warcraft 2, which I remember 20 years later because I played that game so much. Part of the thing that was feeding into how many really good games there was, was we had the end of life cycle of one of, you know, the one system and the beginning of life cycle of the other. So, you know, we had developers that were trying new innovative things right alongside of developers who had perfected the craft of making games for this other system. And so we had this convergence of some really great games that had a really big impact on gaming as things went forward. Mm -hmm. Right. And and in 95, you're still seeing these, you know, like the platformers you mentioned that were just like, you know, we've been making platformers for a decade now. Like we've boiled out everything that didn't work and we've really perfected it. And so we got some really smooth, really great, you know, 2D platformers that year. But we also started seeing, you know, new stuff starting to bubble at the surface. And I think, you know, that would become more clear over the next few years. But I almost feel like, you know, 2015 is that year where we're starting to to see that happen again and we're starting to see the bubbling up of some new things that we wouldn't have expected Mm -hmm. before and a lot of the stuff that was supposed to come out this year and was pushed back till to 2016 i think is really going to be influential and is going to feel new and gigantic and is going to have you know a huge legacy yeah uh, at the beginning of the year, I actually compared 2015 to 1995, and a lot of the games I used in comparison were either canceled, sadly, or pushed to 2016. But uh, the thing that I think is really cool about both years is that there were a lot of new IPs, mm-hmm. and some of those new IPs are doing something really weird and different, and some of them were just building in the try and true. There were a lot of sequels to beloved franchises, and like I think you need that mix. I think you need that mix of new and exciting stuff, and that mix of refinement, and that mix of sequels, like the old familiar that you can count on. A really good year has choice more than anything else. Like You should be able to, no matter mm-hmm. what you like, you should be able to find stuff you get excited about. And, you know, I'm not going to get excited about some of the games that came out in 2015 or in 1995, but it doesn't matter because they mean a lot to somebody else. Mm -hmm. As we look back on 95, what games do we think really had the most enduring legacy? I mean, you know, I immediately want to give it to either Chrono Trigger or Earthbound, but, you know, that's my bias speaking. I mean, when I look at even this year, (laughs) Earthbound is the game where I can most clearly see the influence on games, but I don't necessarily think that means it's the most influential game of the year. I mean, you could say that about Chrono Trigger 2. 2015 is interesting because we have the situation where... A game that's being nominated for Game of the Year was only made by one person and is very clearly a descendant of sorts of of Earthbound. Right. 
And then, you know, in 95, we have Earthbound. Right. I think Earthbound was way more influential than anyone would have predicted in 95. Uh, Because nobody nominated for Game of the Year in 1995. Absolutely nobody. Right. So, like, that goes without saying. But there's also the fact that I feel like Chrono Trigger would have been even more influential if uh, Square Enix hadn't, you know, made a sequel that had almost nothing to do with the stuff that made the original popular. Well, it was a different team. They just shouldn't have made it a Chrono game. Yeah, right. No, it's a good game. Sure, it 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 is. It's a perfectly good game that had almost nothing to do with Chrono Trigger. Uh, And you know, so if they hadn't essentially let the IP die it might have had a lot more influence, and, and that's hard to say. And I mean, there are, like, big fighting games that were really important, and that's harder to see the influence of, too. I mean, Virtua Fighter 2 actually won several game awards in 1995. You can play it in Yakuza 5. <laughs> like, go to the arcade and play a game of the year from 20 years ago. That, that's entertaining. Yeah, and it, uh, Tekken 2, I put a lot of time into Tekken 2 and Tekken 3, because they were still figuring out how to make a th- uh, fighting game work in a 3d space right and the 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 tekken series still exists to this day and they're still putting out new new games and there was a while there where the the fighting genre had kind of died out and it felt like a relic of the past and you know in the past five years we've seen it kind of reborn again it's really kind of interesting to see what was happening in 1995 when the genre was probably experiencing its heyday then and it we're experiencing kind of a second heyday of, of fighting games. I wouldn't say exactly this year, but in 2016 the, for 2006, sure. Yeah, Street Fighter Five. Well Street Fighter Five. But we've we've also like over the the past five years have definitely seen the genre right. come back. Shaq Fu. You know? <laughs> Shaq Fu coming back. <laughs> Uh, adventure games, too, I think, absolutely, we've seen a resurgence of adventure games in recent years, uh, even before this year because of the popularity of Telltale's games. But uh, there were two really interesting adventure games released in 1995, uh, I Have No Mouth and Yet I'm a Scream, which I think is clearly the better game, but also The Dig, which is more like the Until Dawn of 1995. <laughs> um, it was, it's a really cinematic game, Industrial Lights and Magic who mostly became Pixar, worked on it, and they did the cutscenes. It was very much trying to be a horror movie game, and it was maybe a little too influenced by Mist, but... And maybe The Dig probably isn't a super well-remembered game. I only remember because it was a scary game I was allowed to play in 1995, and I wanted to play everything scary and was never allowed to. But, uh... You know, I can see the path to that game. I can see games that are similar to that, even if they weren't direct influence. But I have no mouth, and yet I must scream is maybe a forgotten game, but it's really interesting and impressive in a lot of ways. It's based on the Harlan Ellison book by the same name. Uh, I must clarify, it was a short story and not a novel. Oh, uh, well... My lit degree won't allow me to, to let that go uncorrected. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Uh, Harlan Ellison actually voices the computer in the adventure game. And he uh, wrote the game, too. Th- I didn't know he wrote the game, too, so he also wrote the game, apparently. But no, it was a very good game. It was very well put together. Clock Tower also came out in 1995, and the original Clock Tower wasn't released here. But Clock Tower was sort of one of the first, if not the first, survival horror games that was all about running away without combat. I mean, in 1995, I mean, a game that wasn't a puzzle game with no combat was really very, very innovative. And I wish it did come out here. You can play it with an English patch. Mm -hmm. You know, you're a scared girl. You have no weapons to speak of. There are things that want to kill you and you have to hide and run away a lot. And, you know, that's tense. That's interesting. I I think the first Clock Tower is the worst in the series that I've played. But it's cool. It's influential. And I think absolutely people had affection for the Clock Tower series. I think developers saw what Clock Tower did and then became focused on making less action-heavy horror games. Even Silent Hill, Mm -hmm. which does have combat and came after Clock Tower, you can see how it might have been influenced. Like, hey, you know, this guy can fight, but maybe he won't be super strong and he will run away a lot. And, you know, even Twisted Metal, would Rocket League exist without the popularity of the Twisted Metal series? Maybe, maybe not. Mm Mm-hmm. So one game uh, called Terranigma. Terranigma is a great game. And Terranigma is a very good game. It feels a little sparse compared to some other action RPGs, uh, even of the time, like Secret of Mana, which came out in 94, I believe, uh, or even a 
its uh, spiritual predecessor, Illusion of Gaia. But, you know, I wanted to mention it because I think it's interesting that there's this really good game that was released in, uh, you know, Europe, but not here. Uh, Secret of Mana came out in 1993. 93. Oh, what, I thought. Uh, what about Rystar? Rystar right. and Comic Zone. Comic Zone was, was interesting for its time because, oh, look, here's a Sega Genesis brawler that, you know, is comic book based and you hop between panels and that was kind of neat. Well, it was, yeah, it was, it was like saying, how can we make a brawler feel like a comic book? And it was very very innovative in how it did it. You could like punch people and they would fly backwards and bust through the the mm-hmm. comic book panel. And, you know, you would like drop down through the floor and you'd be like hanging from the, the, the bar, like the, the panel bar between, you know, between panels and things like that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there was sequences where you would have to like crawl, get from one page to the other page and things. And so it was really fun in, in that way. But I mean, I think, I think the 2D brawler was really on its way out at that point. And so it wasn't as influential as it would have been had it come out 10 years earlier. And I don't think being influential is necessarily the only thing that matters. The Tales series began in 1995, and Tales is probably a series that I love specifically because they don't innovate too much. It's old, it's familiar, it's comforting, it's full of cliches, they're always fun to play, and a Tales game is probably never going to be a game of the year for me. They're a security blanket for me. It feels so good to go play a Tales game and get all these corny old cliches cliches that I loved from when I was a kid and played JRPGs and I'm, I'm glad they didn't innovate too much. I haven't played Tales of Zestiria. Mm. I don't know, the one that came <laughs> out this year. But uh, I look forward to playing it sometime next year when I don't have as many games to play. If I ate meat, it would be like having a bowl of chicken noodle soup. It's when I'm sick, I want to play Tales games. It feels good. What's and wrong with a bowl of uh, vegetable soup? That's right. It's uh, tomato soup and grilled cheese sandwich. Mm, tomato and basil. Mm. Rayman came out in 1995. Rayman Legends is my game of the year for 2013. But uh, I didn't get into Rayman until Rayman 2 on the mm-hmm. Dreamcast, which I think also released on the PS1, but I only played it on the Dreamcast. Yeah, I was disappointed um, when I rented it. I thought it was going to be the video game adaptation of Rain Man. <laughs> if um, only. But... A Rain Man platformer. Yeah. What a game. But uh, I'm not very good at precision jumping, and so I always really loved Rayman and Kirby because mm-hmm. you can sort of get around that in both games. Mm-hmm. And uh, Kirby's Dream Land 2 actually released in 95 as well. And uh, it's not a greatest game of all time, but it was probably my one of my most loved games on the old Game Boy. Mm-hmm. I play, I don't even know how much I played it. I tried so hard to 100% that game and failed. <laughs> <laughs> but because uh, they're both really floaty platformers with sort of a cutesy aesthetic. I mean, Raymond Origins and Raymond Legends are some of the most beautiful games ever made, mm-hmm. in my opinion. They're really collectible heavy. They're exactly what I want a platformer to be. Mm. I don't trust anybody who doesn't have arms or legs. <laughs> There were some super weird Raymond ads back in the day. Like, I remember one where it was a bunch of guys at urinals and, like, Raymond was there and people were trying to figure out how Raymond was peeing. (laughs) It made me super uncomfortable. I think maybe that's why I didn't play Raymond in 1995 is Uh I did not want to think about how Raymond peed. Yeah, no shaft, just a bell end. (laughs) (laughs) I'll also say that I'm very reluctant to name and put any game that's new on a game of all time list. I think you always need a few years. And that's the fun thing about going back to a year like 1995 and trying to talk about it is you have so much space and you can really look at the games in a different way. No more hype. No more seeing something that seemed really cool, but somebody does something better Mm -hmm. just a few months later. You look at like The Witcher 3 and maybe down the road somebody comes out with a game that's takes all the things you love from it and you know really the witcher 4 (laughs) (laughs) i was just going to say even if you look at 2013 both bioshock infinite and the last of us us Mm -hmm. look like i kept wanting to call it like a strange 
uh, look like they were going to be game of all time contenders. And I think maybe The Last of Us is the only one that's aged well enough for that. Mm -hmm. The Last of Us really emphasized a lot of the problems that were wrong with Bioshock Infinite with the whole like little narrative dissonance thing. Like uh, Bioshock Infinite like never really figured out what combat meant inside of its storytelling, mm -hmm. whereas The Last of Us did. You know, mm -hmm. when you when you see this human being and you smash him in the face with a brick in The Last of Us, it has an emotional impact and it resonates with you mm -hmm. in in a way that you know shooting a bunch of cultists in the face in Bioshock Infinite just doesn't. Yeah, because there are moments in The Last of Us where trouble is approaching. And you're trying to figure out what's the best way to, to handle it, kill them, get around them, or whatever. And these guys are just having like natural, mundane conversations. That's just like something you just had with Ellie, let's say. And so you're kind of like, wow, I mean, these guys are just out here trying to survive these clickers like me. And now I've got to shiv him in his throat. Why the fuck do I have to shoot these guys? Why, why can't we just go, hey, I'm just passing through. I don't want to take your stuff and I don't want to shoot you. I mean, I, I think the point was in that world, the tension was just too high. Well, because, right. Because, you know, there's probably been a dozen people that have approached them from, mm -hmm. uh, with that same thing. Like, oh, hey, we're just passing through. Right. And then have like robbed the shit out mm -hmm. of them. Right. No, exactly. And so I get that. And But like, that's, that's what The Last of Us does. Or... Uh, watching Ellie evolve through the game, you know, where at first she, she was just this kid that couldn't do a lot. And then as the game progressed, there she was capable of taking care of herself more and more. I will, again, always remember, all right, I'm standing here by the door. I'm lining up my shot for when this guy comes out. And then Ellie just spider monkeys up and stabs him in the neck. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, apparently, and I've never really been successful at this, but uh, allegedly... If you had an empty revolver and no bullets, you could still, you know, fake people out mm -hmm. and like swing your gun around and be like, you know, pointed at them and they would dodge out of the way and then you could like run past them. That's one of the one promises and things that I was looking forward to with I Am Alive. Right, um, right. That they just d couldn't deliver on. I mean, I think the budget got scaled back for that game. I hope that happens more in the future, though. I think with the survival genre, like, becoming as big as it is now, I think I think we'll see more of that type of thing. So what is everybody excited for in 2016? No Man's Sky, just hands down. Yeah, but that won't be coming out. <laughs> as a release date now. Of course. For the first time in history. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm excited for The the Witcher 3 to become a, pr a price that I can afford it. Mm -hmm. So when 2016 comes around, then I'll, I'll be back to playing Witcher you 3. Know, Witcher 4 yeah. is supposedly going to have Siri as a protagonist. Well, then maybe I'll wait for a year <laughs> after The Witcher 4 comes out. Well, I'll say The Witcher 3 Blood and Wine expansion. Everything I've heard about it so far, of course, it's all PR. Yeah. But it sounds like it's going to be fantastic. Um, and my number one right now, I think even possibly more so than No Man's Sky, just because I don't want to jinx that game coming out, uh, is Firewatch. Firewatch looks fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. I'm excited for The Witness as well. It looks oh, really cool. The two games I'm really excited about are Persona 5, mm -hmm. which was supposed to come out this year, but Persona 4 is one of my favorite games of all time, and I'm expecting it to be amazing. And then Near Automata which is the sequel to Nier, which is also one of my favorite games of all time. Platinum Games is working on it. It's got a female protagonist. The gameplay trailer looks so good, and I'm just expecting it to be an amazing game. I am not uh, looking forward to uh, the next Far Cry. Primal? Yeah. I mean, seeing it in action, everything just looks like it's reskinned. It looks like it was going to be a $40 game, mm -hmm. and I was surprised to see that they were going to charge full price for it. So yeah, I don't know. That one, I mean, it may, maybe... And what is that? Horizon Dawn? Or? Horizon Zero Dawn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fighting robot dinosaurs. Come on. And then, of course, whatever Assassin's Creed is doing next year. I'm sure they'll have two games come out. Um, I want to see what the Fallout DLC is going to look like. Fallout 4. Yeah, no, I'm sure it'll be a great DLC, and I'm sure I'll spend a lot of time next year playing yeah. Fallout 4. So, yeah, you know, hey, 2015. Boy, it's been a year for games. You know, many of us are still just plugging in the hours. 2016's got a couple of promising ones on the Zero Dawn horizon, but that's a far cry from... I'm sorry, I'm going to stop there, but listen. <laughs> I'd like to, uh, on a personal note, thank everybody for uh, listening, you know, joining us every week. 
25 in a row. We've got at least two more left in us before the whole thing uh, derails. But uh, <laughs> seriously, though, I uh, appreciate the time that we spend huddled around this mic, and uh, hopefully everybody out there enjoys it. I want to wish everybody a happy new year. Be safe. Don't get too old. And uh, keep your new year's resolutions to a minimum and to yourself. I don't want to hear anything about them. <laughs> With that, thank you all, and we're out. Let me try it. Maybe Not somebody's really. sticking their butt in somebody's face right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a joke. <laughs>